Greetings. Uh, welcome to the Bartlett Woods Church of Christ online Bible study. I'm Stan Phipps, and Lord willing, I'll be teaching you Hebrews today. We started the study a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we've uh, been having a very interesting study about the superiority of Jesus. In the first chapter, we learned that uh, Jesus was superior over the prophets. And we learned also that he was superior over the angels. In chapter 2, last week, we saw that, uh, that we need to be careful of our salvation because if the message spoken by angels at Mount Sinai was important and uh, had consequences, if you did not uh, follow that, uh, that message, what do you think is going to happen if the message spoken by Jesus Christ is not followed, is not heeded. So uh, it's a very interesting study. Last week we also uh, were reminded in chapter 2 of Jesus' humanity and that he was a very merciful and faithful high priest. Well, Lord willing, here in just a moment, we're going to look at chapter 3 and we're going to see where the writer contrasts Jesus with one, with one of their national heroes. Moses. And the writer is also going to caution us about any unbelief. I'm looking forward to that study and I hope you are too. Before we go into God's Word, let's go to him in prayer and ask for his help. Father, I thank you so much uh, for your Word and for the blessing that it is to us. Father, thank you for Hebrews. Thank you, Father, that this uh, book, sermon, uh, and shows us about Jesus and just how wonderful he is. He's above all and he's greater than anything, Father. And I pray that you'll uh, be with me and help me, Father, as I open up uh, this uh, chapter 3 today. I pray, Father, that you'll be with our listeners, our viewers, our hearers, and help them, Father, to understand uh, your word so that their lives can be fuller, so that they can grow in their faith in Jesus Christ, so that they can be better servants of yours. Uh, thank you, Father, for hearing this prayer. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Okay, let's uh, look at chapter 3, and we want to read uh, verses 1 through 6 of chapter 3. The Hebrew writer says, Therefore, <clears throat> holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest, whom we confess. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, testifying to what he would uh, that what would be said in the future but Christ is faithful as a son over God's house and we are his house if we hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast man this uh, first verse is uh, full of information for us information that we just need to kind of stop and look at it's a real blockbuster. Uh, it, there's a rarity here when he says holy brothers. It's very rare that you see holy and brothers uh, together. You'll see holy very often in the New Testament, and you see brothers very often in the New Testament. But this is one of only two times that uh, holy brothers uh, are is used together. And uh, it's a very important uh, message for us today. Uh, and he says that, uh, therefore, holy brothers, when he says therefore, he's referring back to the earlier uh, paragraph which he uh, wrote about, spoke about uh, Jesus as a faithful uh, high priest. And he's uh, kind of making an emphasis there. Therefore, uh, we share a heavenly calling. I want you to, I want you to let that sink in a little bit. If you're saved... If Jesus is your Savior, we're brothers, we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and we share a heavenly calling. Does that make you feel good? It's a good feeling for me to think about sharing this heavenly calling that Jesus calls us and, and God calls us 
and he wants us to be his. He wants us to be saved. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, we find what Jesus would say, but go and learn what this means, he says. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have come to call the right, not call, excuse me, I'm going to back up, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Yes, we are called, and we share that heavenly calling that makes us heavenly, uh, holy, and righteous uh, brothers. And he says there in verse 1, he tells them, encourages them to fix your thoughts on Jesus. Now, this is more than just, well, I want you to look at him for a second. I just, I want you to to think about him. I want you to remember him. Uh, the same word for this uh, fix your thoughts, the same word is used in Luke chapter 12, verse 24, when Jesus says, uh, tells the people to consider the ravens. And that idea is you look close. You consider this. You do some thinking about this. How does that work? How does this apply? You put some real thought and meditation when you think about uh, Jesus. You, you consider all that he's done for you and how important he is. And here, it's interesting, uh, the only place in all of the Bible where Jesus is called an apostle. No other time is, is he called an apostle. And you probably... Uh, didn't know that, or you might have uh, not thought about that in a long, long time. You see, the, the word apostolos is just, basically is just one who was sent. Uh, it's an envoy. It's a lot like an ambassador. Jesus chose 12 apostles, and here uh, the Hebrew writer is saying that Jesus was sent, and he was. God sent him to this world to save the world. In Mark chapter 9, verse 37, uh, Jesus would say, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Yes, Jesus is an apostle. He was sent by God to save the world. Jesus refers to himself numerous times. Uh, as being sent by God. Now I've got a a, a, a little thing that I want to say. I, 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 it bothers me today when I uh, hear people, pe pe preachers, calling themselves an apostle. That that irritates me. It gets under my skin. Now, if you just take it as the word says that yes, uh, they've been sent by God. But when, to me, when they use, uh, when a, another man, other than the ones that Jesus uh, chose, other uh, than uh, Jesus himself, it kind of uh, leads me to think that that man thinks that, that he is given special messages by God. And he's been given the ability to perform miracles by God. And you must listen to him because he's an apostle. Well, uh, we should know that the ones that Jesus chose, those 12, were given special abilities and they were especially chosen by him to do a specific task. God chose his son specifically and gave him powers and abilities, uh, which, you know, he already had that, but he was to do those things to bring us uh, to God. And so uh, I just don't use that word apostle uh, lightly. Verse 1 says that not only was he an apostle, but he was also a high priest. We looked at that uh, last week in the latter part of chapter 2, uh, verse 17, I guess that would be. A high priest's responsibility was to represent uh, man to God and to represent God to man. He was the intermediary. He was the mediator uh, for, that, uh, for that relationship between God and man, and, and the high priest back in the uh, Mosaic law, back during Moses' time and uh, up until the new law, uh, that high priest would go into the most holy place once a year. There was only one high priest, and he was to go into that most holy place only once a year. And there he would go into that small room and before the Ark of the Covenant and before that atonement cover and he would uh the, he would represent the people and represent God and find forgiveness for their sins 
in that place uh, once a year. And so this is Jesus. He didn't have to make a uh, sacrifice for his sins because he was sinless. And he didn't have to do that every year. He did that once. He was our high priest. He is our high priest and he is our mediator between God. And he made that atonement uh, for our sins. And that's what we confess. That person, and what to the Hebrew writer says, that person is the one that we confess. It's just like that confession that uh, Philip asked the eunuch to make in Acts chapter 8 when the eunuch wanted to be baptized. And uh, Philip says, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And the eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the confession that we make, that we share, that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And we have Jesus as our apostle, as our high priest, and that he uh, is our Savior. We are holy brothers. That's it's a sweet thought. In verse 2 there, it says, again, it says, he was, he was faithful to the one who appointed him, speaking of Jesus, just as Moses was faithful in all of God's house. Uh, Jesus was faithful to God just as Moses was faithful to God and his household. See, uh, this uh, look at Moses is something that, that we appreciate Moses, but the Jews, uh, uh, they revered Moses. He was the one that was raised in a, as an Egyptian. He was commissioned by God uh, at uh, the burning bush to, to go get his people and free them from uh, Egyptian slavery. Uh, Moses appeared before Pharaoh and says, God says to let my people go. It was Moses that performed the, those ten powerful plagues, and Moses led them through the Red Sea. And, of course, all of this is with God's help. God is telling Moses what to do. And Moses led them through the wilderness, and he got water from the rock and manna and quail, and he was uh, there leading them in the fight against the Amalekites, and he received the Ten Commandments and, and gave them to the Israelites. He interceded for them uh, over the golden calf debacle. Uh, Moses was their hero. He was their champion. He was the lawgiver. And they had a great respect. Even some of the Jews worshipped Moses. And uh, the Hebrew writer here is saying Moses was a faithful in all of God's house, but Jesus was faithful too. He goes on in verse 3 and says, Jesus is greater than Moses. And, and look again at how he, he words this. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as a builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. Uh, Moses was their hero. He was their miracle worker, lawgiver. Some did worship Moses. But you see, uh, the builder of a house uh, is more has more glory than the house itself. And what the Hebrew writer here is saying is Jesus is the builder of that house. Jesus is divine. He and God built that house. Jesus and God built everything, he says in verse 4. So, which is greater, uh, the house or the one in the house? Uh, the builder of the house uh, or the house. And Moses, uh, Moses was, was a very uh, faithful servant in God's household, as, we saw, as he mentions in verse 5. And he testified to what would be said in the future. Now, Moses was, uh, was a shadow of the things that were to come, is what we find in, would find, we'll find in verse 10. But uh, I I want us to look a little closer and just see how God looked at Moses and how the people uh, respected Moses. In Numbers chapter 12, we see uh, a very interesting and uh, it's, it's fairly well-known incident with Moses and Miriam and Aaron and God. Okay, They have this meeting. In Numbers chapter 12, starting in verse 1, Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. 
Has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they asked? Hasn't he also spoken through us? And the Lord heard this. Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. At once the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out to the tent of meeting, all three of you. So the three of them came out, and then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud. He stood at the entrance to the tent and summoned Aaron and Miriam. When both of them stepped forward, he said, Listen to my words. When a prophet of the Lord is among you, I reveal myself to him in visions. I speak to him in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak face to face, clearly, and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? The anger of the Lord burned against them, and he left them. When the cloud lifted from above the tent, there stood Miriam, leprous like snow, Aaron turned toward her and saw that she had leprosy. And he said to Moses, Please, my Lord, do not hold against us the sin we have so foolishly committed. Do not let her be like a stillborn infant coming from its mother's womb with its flesh hath eaten away. So it goes on to say that Moses cried out to the Lord and the Lord did uh, eventually heal her. Jesus is greater than than Moses, and Moses was very faithful to God. And so in verse 6 there, we see that Christ, uh, the anointed one is what Christ means, is the faithful son over God's house. Moses is a servant in God's house. Jesus Christ is a son. There's a world of difference in a servant and a son. And You know, when he's talking about house here, he's talking about the household. He's talking about the family. He's talking about his group of people. Uh, Paul would write to Timothy about this in 1 Timothy 3, verse 15. And he wrote, If I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Moses was a faithful servant of the God and of his house. Jesus is the son over the house. And then he says there in verse 6, he says, uh, we are his house if we hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast. You know that if is a little bitty word. It's a conditional word. But that little bitty word comes with big ramifications. You know how many times if is used in the Bible? Well, what little look I I did into it, it's used over 600 times in the Bible. And you better pay attention when you see that little bitty word if. If is conditional and you need to follow those conditions. He says if. We hold on to our courage. And he's telling these people that uh, are, are being persecuted and, and thinking about going back to uh, the Jewish law and the Jewish way of doing things. He says, hold on. Hold on. You'll, you'll receive this, uh, uh, this hope, this, this, what we're confident in. You'll receive it if you just have courage. Hold on. If you'll just... Keep that hope, you know, realizing that you may not have uh, received that uh, blessing today, but, th- but it's there in the future, and, and you continue to remain faithful to God, and your hope will be realized. In Colossians chapter 1, uh, verses 21 through 23, Paul would write, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation if you continue in your faith established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, have become a servant. 
You'll receive that. You'll receive that, uh, what, that goal that you have if you're faithful, if you uh, remain true and are not moved in, in your hope. It's a, it's a very important thing for us to realize uh, just uh, what is at stake here. Let's read uh, verses 7 through 11 now of chapter 3. So, as the Spirit says, Today, if you hear His voice and do not harden your hearts, as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me and for 40 years saw what I did, this is why I was angry. That is why I was angry with that generation. And I said, their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Here he says, as the Holy Spirit says, you know, earlier when he was uh, quoting from Psalm 8, he says, as someone has testified, he knows uh, where this is from. That's just a, a way that they would reference uh, their scriptures in that day. So he says, as the Holy Spirit says, we, we find in Second Peter chapter 1 that the Holy Spirit is uh, what uh, helped men to write uh, the Word of God. In Second Peter chapter 1, verse, verses 20 and 21, Peter would write, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation, for prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so the Hebrew writer says, as the Holy Spirit says. And he quotes Psalm 95, which is a, a wonderful psalm. Uh, the Septuagint attrib attributes this psalm to David. And the first seven verses of the psalm, are, are, that's, that's the first half of the psalm, it's very stirring. And it's uh, praising uh, uh, and worshiping our Creator. Well, the second half of that uh, song takes this big turn, a big bend in the road, and it's a stern warning for those who would not believe and not to obey our God. And so, this is uh, what he's. This is what he quotes here. That last half of Psalm 95. If you hear his voice, don't harden his heart. Not like you did in the rebellion. Your fathers tested me forty years. I saw what you did. I was angry with you. And uh, so uh, it's, it, it's pretty serious. It's pretty strong. Uh, the psalm, this part is actually about uh, two events that, uh, that the Israelites experienced while they were uh, wandering uh, in the wilderness uh, between Sinai and be between uh, getting into uh, the land of Canaan. In Acts 17, verses 1 through 7, we see that uh, right uh, quickly after they were uh, free from uh, free from Egypt, after they'd seen these mighty plagues, and after God had just miraculously saved them going through uh, the Red Sea, uh, they were thirsty, and they began to grumble, and uh, they began to quarrel. Uh, they were upset, and so uh, Moses uh, was was given the task to get water from a rock. So God. Uh, told him to strike the rock, and sure enough, when he struck the rock, water came forth, and everybody got a drink. Now, I've got to tell you, uh, it's important for me to get something to drink. I can kind of uh, commiserate with the Israelites. When, when I have a doctor's uh, procedure, and they say nothing after midnight, I just start going nuts thinking about, it. I can't get a drink of water after midnight. And uh, so um, I, I really feel for them. And uh, I don't know if I'd have been among them fussing or not, but because of their quarreling, uh, Moses uh, called this place Massa and Meribah. And that was testing and quarreling. And God remembered that. God remembered what they did and how they had a lack of faith in him and that he would take care of them after everything that they had seen. And then the other incident was uh, the failure of the Canaanites. It came uh, quite a bit after that. But it was, did I say Canaanites? I'm sorry. 
the failure of the of the Israelites to to go into the promised land. Uh, it was time for them to go, and uh, God says He sent uh, men to explore the the land of Canaan, and they came back, and they came back with a cluster of grapes that was so big that it took a pole and two men uh, to carry that. But they also saw giants in the land and in numbers chapter 13 it ends with we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes and looked the same to them and so they and all that god had done for them all the many mighty things that they had seen him provide for them and protect them they were like no we can't do that we're not going and so god got mad uh, joshua and caleb both said we can do this and the people got together and they said, no, we can't. And so in uh, Numbers chapter uh, 14, uh, verses 26 through 35, we see God mad at them. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, how long will this wicked community grumble against me? I have heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. So tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very things I heard you say. In this desert, your bodies will fall. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who was counted in the census and who has grumbled against me, not one of you will enter the land. I swore with uplifted hand to make your home except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. As for your children that you said would be taken as plunder, I will bring them in to enjoy the land you have rejected. But you, your bodies will fall in this desert. Your children will be shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness until the last of your bodies lies in the desert. For 40 years, one year for each of the 40 days you explored the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have me against you. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will surely do these things to this whole wicked community which has banded together against me. They will meet their end in this desert. Here they will die. So they really, really made God mad because of their unbelief. He had the promised land there before them and they were afraid and they said, no, no, we can't do this. How sad is that? Uh, 40 years in the wilderness because of their unbelief. Verse 9 uh, says there, uh, where your fathers tested me and for 40 years I saw what you did. You know, during those 40 years, apparently, they exasperated God even more with their grumbling and complaining. There was another incident in the Kadesh Barnea, we find in Numbers chapter 20, uh, where they needed water again, and something uh, pretty tragic happened. This time, God told Moses to speak to the rock, and Moses was mad, and he was upset, and he struck the rock instead of speaking to the rock. God went on ahead and gave them water, but because of Moses' disobedience, because of that right there, his disobedience, he didn't speak to the rock, he struck the rock, he did not get to go into the promised land. Now you got to wonder, why did Moses do that? Maybe he was angry. Maybe he was livid and he had struck the rock originally the, the first time and he just, for, he was so mad he forgot what he was going to do. Or, or maybe he just he just thought, man, I'm, I'm, I'm just angry. I'm going to, I just want to show them how angry I am. But whatever reason, if he forgot or whether he's just angry or what, he didn't do what God told him to do and he did not get to go into the promised land. Uh, let's look at verses 12 through 15. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we, if, we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. And has just been said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. He says, Brothers, don't have a sinful, unbelieving heart. 
he knows that they're thinking about slipping away. He knows that they're fixing to leave their first love. He knows that they're fixing to go back into Judaism. And he's saying, don't have that sinful, unbelieving heart. You know, the heart to the Jew, and in that day, the heart is the center of intelligence and emotion. You know, told to guard our hearts. And all that Israel had seen of God, all that they had experienced and they were beginning to not trust God. He did not want them to refuse to follow him. He did not want them to lose their trust in God. And that's that would be a sinful, unbelieving heart. And he says, don't turn away from the living God. And that's who God is. He's not stone. He's not a block of wood, but, but he's living. He's alive. He sees all. He knows all. He moves mountains. He splits the waters. He feeds and cares for millions. He's done all this for you. Don't turn away from the living God. He says, encourage one another. Uh, that's what we need to be doing. Uh, we, we all need encouragement. Even in this day and time when when we're just we're down because we're not getting to meet together like we used to get to meet and it seems like everybody's mad at everybody in the world and it just seems like it's more and more of a a dangerous place in which to live and we need to constantly be encouraging one another that's what the church is all about that's what the hebrew writer is saying he said daily be in there continuously routinely not, it's not a hit and miss thing. It's not a hot and cold thing, but continue to build each other up, to give each other in, encouragement, to give each other courage. And he says, today, take, take that opportunity today. Take advantage of today. You know, today is all that we have. Today is what some say is, is all that we've been promised. We don't know what the future holds. The psalmist would write in Psalm 118, 24, This is a day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Paul would write to the church at Corinth in the second letter, in the chapter 6, verse 2, he would say, uh, For he says, In the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. Paul would go on to say, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Let's take care of today. If we're not right with God today, let's take care of that right now. Don't wait another day. If you can encourage someone today, do that right now because we don't need anyone uh, to fall away uh, from the living God and to succumb to the sin, uh, to sin's deceitfulness is what he would uh, write in verse 13. But encourage one another today, so long as you call today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Sin can make us think uh, what we're not. Sin can can lead us away from God. Uh, in John 8, 44, Jesus would say, to uh, very sternly, he would say, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Sin can be so deceitful when we think, oh, I'm okay, it's going to be all right. When we think, oh, no one's going to find out. When we think, oh, I can drop this at any time I want to. Oh, there's really nothing wrong with this. And uh, I, a long, long time ago when I was in college, I worked on the golf course at Meadowbrook Country Club across uh from the river uh, from here. And I worked with an old black man. His name was Jack Gill. Jack was a good friend of mine, uh, but he had his problems. He he liked to drink. And he would tell me from time to time, he'd say, Stan, that's what he called me, Stan. He would say, whiskey make you feel like you got a million dollars in your pocket and you ain't got but a dollar. And that's all part of sin's deceitfulness. It makes you think one way. In reality, 
it's something very, very different and very, very damaging. Okay, and so then he says in verse uh, 14 there, we have come to share in Christ. Isn't that a sweet uh, thought? We have come to share in Christ if, there's that little bitty word that's so important again, if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. So many things are started and not finished. You know, uh, I can sadly think of people that accepted Jesus Christ, that confessed their faith and was baptized, had their sins washed away. They were added to the church, and they just eventually drifted away. Some I can think of that never came back. No matter who encouraged them, no matter how often they were encouraged, they thought they had arrived, and they never finished their race. They got a good start, but they never really got in to the race. He says, if we hold firmly till the end with confidence, it's so important. The Hebrew writer is trying to encourage them, you hold on. You hold on with hope. You hold on with courage. You hold on with confidence until the end. And in verse 15, he, he, he repeats uh, that passage again, he says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Remain faithful. Keep a sensitive heart. And then uh, verses 16 through 19, he asks the question. Three questions with three answers. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those who Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not those, uh, not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the desert? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest if not to those who disobeyed? Three questions with three answers. He goes on to say, So we see that we are not able to enter because of their unbelief oh man do you see that word rest in there uh, in verse 18 god swears that he would never enter uh that rest that anybody need a rest oh yeah man doesn't the rest sound sweet doesn't it sound awesome canaan uh the land of canaan the promised land was considered a rest from their wanderings their years and years 40 years of wanderings. Rest is used over 275 times in the Bible over and over again. You'll find rest, and the rest would be sweet. In Isaiah 57 verse 21, we find there is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. There's no rest, and there's no peace for the, the, those that have uh, unbelief for the wicked. In verse 19, he would say, their unbelief kept them from the promised land. Oh, no, we look like grasshoppers in their eyes, and they think the same thing. We can't do this. No, we want to go back. And the promised land was right there. They were right at the edge, and they just showed unbelief, which equals disobedience. And the Hebrew writer says, Jesus is greater than Moses. This one that led you through the wilderness, that got you right up to the promised land, he's far greater than the servant because he's the son. And he says, you be careful. Be careful and don't become hard-hearted and uh, unbelieving and lose your rest your salvation. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I hope that this study has been a blessing to you. Uh, don't give up. You keep working. I know that these are some extreme circumstances. We don't get to see each other as, as uh, what we need to. And uh, Take care of your soul. Stay in the Word. Pray. Reach out to people. Get on the phone. Get on the internet and try to maintain uh, your faith and uh, that heart that is supple and 
and sensitive to God and, and His calling. Next week, Lord willing, we're going to look more about the rest, and we're going to look at uh, more about Jesus as our high priest. I'm looking forward to that study. I hope you are too. I'll be looking for you. Same time, same channel. God bless you.